everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, if you didn't already notice, uh, we have some refreshments outside, so you can, if you didn't already grab some, you're, feel free to sneak out and grab some um, throughout the, the event this evening um, and help yourselves. My name is Andrew Christensen. I'm one of the law librarians here um, at WNL Law, and I also teach legal research here in the law school. And it's so great to have uh, our students and staff and faculty here from the law school, but also from the undergraduate side for what promises to be a fascinating interdisciplinary discussion of the classic novel, Lord of the Flies by William Golding. And this marks the six year running that the WNL Law Library has hosted a program featuring viewpoints from our law school faculty and professors from other Washington and Lee academic departments on an interesting, timely, or otherwise remarkable work of popular fiction or nonfiction with a connection to the law. And similar to our first program in 2015, uh, when we read and discussed Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. This year we return to a book that many of you first read in middle school or high school. Um, and just a quick show of hands, who, who read this before in their youth? Just about everybody. Just about everybody. Great. So when, if you're like me, uh, the story had an impact back then, um, both in its vivid and fast-paced style and in the way it portrayed and conveyed fear, uncertainty, conflict, social roles and hierarchies, the essence of leadership, uh, youthful exuberance, and of course the thin line between civilization and savagery. And that's just a few of the facets. So revisiting the story again as adults, I suspect that we understand and view many of the themes differently with the perspective of further life and education, uh, including a legal education for many of us. Uh, and that gives Lord of the Flies new significance and respect as a timeless commentary on human nature and as an illustration of our societal need for groups bound by rules, be it the law of man or the law of the jungle. So published in uh, 1954 as Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize winner uh, William Golding's first book, Lord of the Flies has sold over 25 million copies in English alone. It's been translated into more than 40 languages, spawned two major motion picture adaptations, and has inspired the works and worldview of countless contributors to culture worldwide. The reader is drawn in by the action, suspense, and the inevitable violence as a group of British schoolboys Stranded, on a, stranded by a wartime plane crash, struggle for survival and control on an unpopulated jungle island. With no adults, scant resources, and no promise of rescue, their emotions and impulses are soon at odds with the structure, morals, and expectations of the civilized society that they knew. Encapsulated by a chapter five passage on 91, page 91 of, the, uh, of this edition, quote, the world, that un understandable and lawful world was slipping away. So I'm looking forward to what our panelists have to say about Lord of the Flies and its many layers. Each of them will speak for around 10 to 12 minutes, and then I'd like to open up the floor for your comments uh, and your questions, and we hope that you'll share your thoughts about the story, um, either reading it recently or memories from back in the day, uh, or about anything you've heard here tonight. Um, so hopefully that'll be a vibrant discussion, and I'll do my best to moderate and direct questions at that point. And one additional note is that tonight's event is being video recorded, both the panel and the audience comments portion, and that will publicly be available soon in the Law School's Scholarly Commons digital repository. So now I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists this evening and thank them all for being here with us. First to speak will be Professor Mark Drumble. Mark is the class of 1975 alumni professor of law and director of the Transnational Law Institute here at Washington and Lee and he has been with the university since 2002. He is a world-recognized scholar in several areas, including mass violence and human rights, genocide and wartime atrocity, international governance and criminal law, and he teaches a wide variety of courses here, including the Global Environmental <coughs> Governance uh, course, the Mass Atrocities Seminar, and both contracts and transnational law in our first year curriculum. Mark holds his undergraduate degree and a Master of Arts from McGill University, his JD from the University of Toronto, and master's and doctoral degrees uh, in law from Columbia. His broad and deep body of scholarship includes over 60 articles and book reviews in law reviews and peer reviewed journals, dozens of lectures and conference presentations worldwide, over 35 book chapters and encyclopedia entries, and three authored and edited, edited books, including his most recent, The Research Handbook on Child Soldiers, published by Edward Elger in 2019. Thank you very much for being here, Professor Drumble. And to Mark's left is Professor Lin Chin. Lin is an associate professor in the Washington and Lee Department of Sociology and Anthropology uh, and has been at the university since 2012. Professor Chin earned her bachelor's degree from Cornell and her master's and PhD in sociology from Stanford. 
uh, where she also held several, several positions as a researcher, lecturer, and teaching fellow. Her areas of research and expertise include social psychology, group processes, um, organizational behavior and identity, group cohesion, and status hierarchies. Dr. Chin's scholarly works have appeared in peer-reviewed publications, including the International Journal of Sociology, the Sociological Quarterly, uh, the European Journal of Social Science Research, and she is currently on sabbatical, uh, writing, two very, uh, writing on two very interesting topics. One is the relationship of college identity to students' feelings of fit and belonging on campus, and two, people's stereotypes uh, about organizational structures such as status hierarchies versus egalitarian structures. So I want to give her an extra, extra special thanks for being here with us during her sabbatical, uh, for making time to join us uh, and share her viewpoint from the social sciences. So thank you, Lynn, and welcome to law school. And rounding out our panel is another uh, of our WNL Law faculty, Professor David Eggert. David has been a vis visiting professor of law and professor of practice at Washington and Lee since 2012. He oversees our very valuable and popular academic success program at the law school, um, and that helps ensure our students, that our students have the critical skills to excel in law school and the practice of law. Professor Eggert is a, is a favorite fixture of our first year experience, uh, regularly teaching torts and property to our 1Ls, and he also teaches upper level courses in legal methods and complex litigation. David's scholarly publications and previous legal, legal practice focus on antitrust, torts, and product liability, and search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment. Professor Eggert's professional service and interests as a lawyer have included international work against human trafficking and urban poverty in places like China, India, Zimbabwe, and South Korea, and uh, his work locally with the New Bridges Immigrant Resource Center in his hometown of Harrisonburg. Professor Eggert received his bachelor's degree from Loyola University in New Orleans and his JD from Duke and practiced law for nearly 25 years with the firm of Arnold and Porter in DC prior to entering academia. Uh, David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right. With that, I will turn it over to uh, Mark to get us started with his reflection on Lord of the Flies. Mark. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and thank you for pulling us together to talk about not just the book, but also, in a sense, the life of the law in literature and how literature may be a wonderful place to open up conversations about law. The Lord of the Flies is a tough book. It's a book about a plane. The plane crashes. The pilot bails and dies, turns into a rotting you know, fixture on a hillside. And then the boys are left, and the boys are left on the island to try and make the most of it. And whatever they make of it may be much or little, but most of it is actually heart-wrenching and stomach-churning. Their paths to try to survive end up enmeshing themselves deeply in violence and confrontation and hopes and aspirations that are shattered and perhaps reconstituted. The book has come to stand for conversations about collective violence, has come to stand for realities of the agency of young people. It has come to represent the suffocating nature of hysteria, the power of paranoia, and the search for the beast, a search for a beast outside, when really the most terrifying beast of all lurks within. And then there is law, often presented anemically and pathetically, almost lethargically in a certain sense. On the same page that Andrew quoted from, page 91, there's also a line from Ralph, where Ralph and Jack have a little debate. And Ralph says, the rules are good for nothing. And uh, excuse me, Jack says, the rules are good for nothing. And Ralph replies by saying, we need the rules, quote, because the rules are the only thing we've got. And at that level, you kind of see the, the dissonance among the two. For me, in The Lord of the Flies is also interesting because Golding himself writes from the perspective of a child. The book is dedicated to his mother and his father. So the entire notion of childhood fills this entire context. Both as victims and as victimizers, Simon slayed by a metastasized mob high on hysteria and fear of the beast. 
So I want to talk about three things today, and I want to talk about them unequally. The first is the agency of the child, but the second is the child as the metaphor for the adult and conversations of collective hysteria and collective destruction that take place in other spaces, perhaps not as effectively as in Lord of the Flies, but still powerfully. And lastly, I want to hypothesize, I want to guess, I want to imagine what the next chapter would have been. The book ends abruptly <clears throat> with a man in uniform finding the children. But what would have happened after that had we imagined the next day? And that's the note on which I want to end. So, the agency of children. Here we see one dynamic that I find fascinating. The game versus life. Imaginary violence that crosses a border into actual violence. And this is a theme that is brought forth powerfully within the context of the child, but is also something that resonates very deeply in the world of the adult within collective cataclysm. Last week, I saw a movie called The Lighthouse. I don't know if you've seen it. It's about two men, two adults, William Defoe is one of the main characters. Two men, an older man, Defoe and a younger man. And they man a lighthouse in a very distant rural part, well, rural on the ocean, somewhere up near Maine. And over time together, they're stranded because of a storm and they too turn on each other. They too imagine a parade of horribles in each other's eyes. And they too end up both, I won't give away the line for the end of the film, but they both end up actually in a worse condition than the boys on the island. Of course, we have the Milgram experiment. We have a variety of realities of how individuals in mob-like situations can turn on each other and act in ways that may seem illogical, although we may hear from you that they may actually be logical in a certain sense. For me, the book reminds me of the work I did in Rwanda when I was a defense lawyer following the genocide in the prisons. And it reminds me of that not because I had children as clients, although I had some clients who were children. It reminds me of the contextual, situational nature of violence. The reality that but for the place in space on the island, but for the political place in space of Rwanda in 1994, adults and children would not have committed the acts of violence that they in fact did. Once the violence ended, life returned to normal. These individuals were not dispositionally violent. They became contextually violent, a lot like the work in your PhD thesis, Tobias. And to me, this is a conundrum of criminality when you have realities of the metastasis of desperate anger and desperate sense of survivalism. And that's what I saw in the eyes of my own clients in Rwanda. And to fit a paradigm of individual responsibility to that strikes me as incongruous. But what is also incongruous, and I have a few minutes left and I want to end on this, is how the book actually ends. It ends very dramatically with a rescue. And it assumes as it closes, the adult on the beach says, who's the leader here? Jack takes a step forward and then steps back. And Ralph says, I am, even though Ralph's leadership was at best limpid. And then it just ends. But my question is, what happens next? What happens when these boys get back to the UK? What happens when they get on the rescue ship? What happens when they go back home? Who explains to Piggy's auntie what happened to Piggy? Who tells Simon's family of what happened to Simon in the mob where he was lynched? Does Ralph tattle on Jack? tell everyone that Jack led a group, first of choir boys, then hunters, then warriors with face paint, 
that they traumatized and tyrannized, that they beat up Sam and Eric, brought them to their side, that they said, I will give you meat so you will join us. Does Jack go back and gaslight? Does he deny? Does he say, what are you talking about? What do the other boys say? What does Roger say? And what should we do about what happened on that island? And this is a world that I've thought about a lot for a long time. It's the world of post-conflict justice. What do we do? Should Ralph forget about it? Very natural human reaction. It's in the past. I nominally leave the island as the person in charge. And yes, Mr. Adult, it was just a game. No one threw a rock at Piggy. He just slipped and fell. So too did Simon into the ocean. Or does Jack say what ended up happening was justified? Does Jack respond by saying, I had to feed the people, or we all would have starved. I had to build up morale and assume control. Ralph's obsession with the rules would lead to nothing. Do we set up a truth commission to figure out what exactly happened and try to learn from it? Does the family of Piggy get reparations? Does Ralph Seek counseling for rehabilitation. Should Jack be prosecuted for murder and war crimes, along with the choir boys? Or does Ralph say nothing but get even in the fall when school resumes? Or do they sit next to each other uneasy, like that closing scene in Ariel Dorfman's play, Death and the Maiden, which is a film, the closing scene, where the torture victim and her husband sit uneasily listening to the opera with the torturer, with his family, up in the balcony. Do they sit there like you two guys, arms crossed, looking ahead, right? What happens? And to me, this is a really interesting question and aspect about this particular story. Because from the literary perspective, the story ends with rescue. It's the equivalence in wartime with the story ending with the peace agreement or the genocide ending because the violent side is subjugated. But for the people involved in these forms of violences, it doesn't end then. That's often just the beginning of a whole other phase a whole other space and a whole other place. I've done a lot of work with child soldiers and the operative discursive frame for child soldiers is that they are faultless passive victims. They can't be responsible for any wrongdoing, which means that Jack claims the same victim status than Piggy does, although Piggy is dead. But they all are victimized in this instance by misfortune and without the capacity to engage in deliberate, thoughtful, cruel behavior. Do we accept that? What do we do with Ralph's haunting memories of the song, kill the pig, cut her throat, spill her blood? What do we do pedagogically to ensure that this happens or does not happen again, or if it were to happen, that it would be stopped? Who stands up and says the games got out of hand? So to me, this is the question that I have to you. What would the next chapter be? What should it be? And here the question of authorship, I think, comes in so heavily. Lawyers writing the next chapter would probably sound a bit like me and incline towards the idea of, yes, Jack's perfidy should be avenged through the courts. But others might see things very differently. And others still might say that the next chapter should be one of forgetting and forgetfulness and moving on. And herein to me also lies 
one of the other poignant aspects of the after. Namely, who would actually believe it? Who would believe Ralph if he described what actually happened on the island? The rescuer clearly assumes it's all games. The rescuer would be incredulous. Who would believe Ralph? And you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of what many Holocaust survivors suggested after the Holocaust, after the camps were liberated, that no one would believe that something as outrageous as that actually occurred. In fact, it was so outrageous at the Eichmann trial that one of the authors who wrote a very powerful book, a man who called himself Katsetnik as an author, described Auschwitz as, quote, planet Auschwitz. Because there was something so absolutely incredible and otherworldly about what actually happened that he grew so tired from having to explain the story of what happened because many individuals, certainly at first, would look on him and upon him as an exaggerating confabulator. I wonder here too, and as a final note, what does that say about the listener, about us as listeners to other people's pay? If we ourselves are reluctant to believe the experiences of others, then the entire process of storytelling itself becomes not only painful, but also a searing search for self-justification. As Foucault says, there is nothing more exhausting than having to explain yourself and why you are here over and over again. So all this to say that it's convenient for the book to end when it does. And I'm not suggesting there should be a sequel or a part two <laughs> or a prequel as to how they all got along or not before their plane crashed. But what I am saying is that in our process of moving the kind of pain in this book into the realm of law, into the realm of justice, into the realm of repair, into the realm of reparations, which is what we're doing now, in all aspects of human rights violations, no story can end anymore the way this book does. And the question I would have for you as I sit down is, what would you wish the next chapter to be? What would you wish happens back at the prep school in the fall? Thanks. I'm actually going to stay seated. I know the, these two want to stand, but I'm actually not very used to standing and speaking, so um, I will stay seated. But um, I wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to come here today because I think the Community Reading Project is a really great thing. And I know reading for fun is something that I know I let fall to the wayside when I get busy. Uh, so kudos to everybody who's like taking the time to read during um, a really busy time with your schoolwork. And I really appreciate being given the chance to um, take up reading again for something that's fun. Um, Though I wouldn't necessarily consider our book today, uh, The Lord of the Flies, fun. Um, I don't know about you, I was terrified, and I was really surprised because as almost everybody in the room raised their hand, I remember reading this book in middle school, and I remember reading ahead of my class because I didn't want to stop. Um, but now, having reread the novel decades later, um, I can honestly say that this was more scary now than when I was a kid, and I actually had the reaction, do you guys know the TV show Friends? Um, there's this character named Joey who, like, he, he puts books in the freezer when he doesn't want to know what's going to happen next, and I actually had the same kind of reaction. I had to put the book down, I'm like, I don't want to know, I can feel something terrible is coming, um, because it was really scary seeing each chapter, this kind of evolution of the group dynamics of what is a little band of castaways who were transformed from boys playing at being hunter <coughs> to an organized killing machine. 
And so today, I actually wanted to take a slightly different take um, uh, and share a perspective that may or may not run counter to your own analyses of the group dynamics. Um, because I don't want to focus on the internal but the external, and I don't want to focus on what's irrational but what is rational about why we got what we got. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they read this story, they see as a major theme the tension between Ralph and Jack as kind of a struggle over who wields power. Who has the material resources to impose the cultural norms um, and the framework about how the boys will live? Because maybe you read the escalation of the tensions between Ralph and Jack as kind of a heightened struggle for ascendancy over the most important resources to the group, so manpower and fire. Um, and whoever got to hold that power gets to dictate how they're to be used and what they're be to used for. And when you do that, the interpretation you get is one that pits Ralph as this character who is a representative of kind of a more democratic order, of rationality, of clear morality, who as a character is able to fight his internal demons um, within against Jack, who is really an envious kind of cruel, scary specter of destruction who gave in to his internal hunger for power and savagery and lack of values. But I don't think this is the only way to read this. Like, I, I know this may be somewhat controversial, but I believe we can read the situation in other ways. And in a way that doesn't see the transition of leadership um, and group structure as a slow kind of irrational descent of children into a more base, naturally wild, destructive, violent nature as they forget kind of the rules of society and order that they've been socialized into. Um, and instead, I think we can argue that we can see the boy's choice to join Jack and defer to his influence as logical, as rational, given the changing constraints facing the group. Because I argue that the collective goals of the group shift over the time as the group becomes increasingly unable to realize that rescue was coming. As the group's goals collectively move from trying to be rescued from their temporary exile to one of trying to survive on an island with a higher quality of life, then it shouldn't be a surprise that the traits valued in the group change from those that support Ralph's claim to leadership over Jack, as opposed to Jack's. So when the plane initially crashes on the island, the survivors are at first most concerned with returning back to life as they know it. So it's not a surprise that Ralph, who embodies authority as they knew it in their former life, um, is the one who was elected as leader. He's the one who took the initiative to gather all the castaways together with the conch. He offers a plan for how to assess the situation and attract a ship for rescue and how to survive um, uh, in these circumstances. And he's all wrapped up in this acceptable leader package. He's older, he's athletic, he's calm, he's charismatic, he's attractive. More so in ways than like Piggy, who had better ideas, <laughs> but was wrapped up in a package that isn't acceptable uh, or like had, doesn't have the values and the qualities that are valued by the boys collectively. So Ralph, of course, as we know, focuses the group's efforts towards making shelter and maintaining a fire, which, you know, so they can have smoke, which makes sense collectively as a goal if the goal is to be rescued. However, if you think about it, the longer the group has remained on the island, the less likely and the more far away it must seem um, that rescue should be. And probably the more salient, the higher the quality of life, the boys will probably be more interested in, right? So um, it seems rational that the boys collectively would desire more fun than work, more variety of food than just fruit. Um, and instead be constantly working and being vigilant for some rescue that may never happen. So when you also add into this kind of the context that there is the monster, right? The supposed monster inhabiting the island, which they then felt immediate danger. It makes sense that the Jack's characteristics as cachet, as one who can create fun by leading hunts, playing fort, he's a hunter and a protector, so he can protect the boys and get the meat, rises in value. The goals of the group shifted as the context of their environment as they knew it changed. And with it, the qualities valued in a leader also did. And so I, I kind of realized that this view of transition of leadership to someone who can help the group collectively attain more fun, freedom, meat, like ends up being more sympathetic to Jack, who I really personally don't want to sympathize with. Yet I also can't turn away from this other interpretation of the bone that Jack had with Ralph. 
And that is, instead of being a witness to a power struggle over dominance and the right way to govern between Jack and Ralph, I argue that what went down with them was a struggle over status and respect in the group. Now you're probably all looking and thinking like, uh, Lenny, there's not much difference between power and status. And instead, a lot of people think that power and status are the same concepts. Or they even consider status as something that is some sort of kind of shiny veneer that's showered onto like power holders and gilds them post facto with legitimacy. But I argue that we do a really big disservice to thinking about group dynamics if we ignore how much a desire for esteem, respect, and value is a motivator for people into action for change. Sociologists make a distinction between power and status. They redefine power as the capacity to coerce people into action regardless of their will, against their own will. And in this regard, we can think of power as kind of control over material resources, such that one can gain power by seizing important resources, just like Jack did, right? He raided Ralph's camp for fire, takes Piggy's glasses by force. But power is different from status. Status is esteem, it's respect, it's honor, and it's from others. Status is something inherently social and cannot be obtained on one's own nor taken by force. Status can only be conferred to you by others who collectively agree that you have value, you have esteem, respect within the group. And so while Jack was able to grab power over the collective, it, he was never really ever able to rise in esteem over Ralph. At the outset, hitting a C sharp and being head choir boy was not as much valued as Ralph's supposedly obvious leadership qualities. And in the lake of letting the fire go, Jack's decision to gather the hunters and make that first kill was initially denied value to the group. Indeed, it was clear that Jack believed his contributions as a hunter and protector wasn't given proper respect um, that he believed uh, was important by Ralph or by the group members. Um, and you could probably remember his anger when he, you know, after that first kill, uh, Ralph kept bringing up the issue of keeping the fire alive and Simon refused to eat his meat. And Jack yelled, eat, damn you, take it. I got you meat and kind of like throws the meat at them. And, and Golding himself describes Jack while he yells, he's like numberless and inexpressible frustrations combined to make his rage elemental and awe-inspiring. So the denial of status and gratitude for his pains had a really palpable effect on Jack's anger. And if that weren't enough, Ralph listened to Piggy, who was a group outsider, couldn't hunt, couldn't fight, couldn't track, he seemed to respect his opinions more, listen to him. He never really went out and said, like, I support Jack's influence. Thus, when Jack's ability to hunt, track, kill, like all those things that could benefit the community were continuously not given respect that he thought they merited, it's not really a wonder that he revolted and tried to change the entire system. Um, as with the interchange about the beasts in indicated, what about my hunters, uh, uh, Jack had asked, and Ralph had replied, boys armed with sticks. Up until that point, Jack still worked within the system. It was only after that he blew the conch, which led to the big public confrontation, and it was only after when he was denied face in that confrontation that Jack left to start an alternative tribe that you know, rendered the group apart. And so one can read this book as the constant denial of status to Jack and the tragic aftermath that ensues from that kind of denial. Jack lost his public bids for leadership from the group twice. He never gained followers through a legitimate election. Even his own followers snuck out uh, away from Ralph's camp to join his secretly. Jack only holds on to power through dominance, which is based on intimidation, threat, fear. And it's his undoing, since it's the smoke that calls the grown-ups. And we see that leadership through dominance is not a stable position, because when fear disappears, as we saw at the end of the book, you know, as Mark said, um, Golding even writes, you know, what's left is a little boy who remains with an extraordinary black cap on his red hair and carries the remains of a pair of spectacles on his waist. Started for it, then changed his mind and stood still. One can read into Jack's rebellion as a strong cry for public acknowledgement and respect for the value he thinks he collectively brings to the group, as much as it is an innate desire for power. 
And in this, I think Jack's desire for status and privilege really reflects something about our present situation and the importance of acknowledging the power of status. Threats to status can create very lasting and real behavioral outcomes. Research has really found that status and feeling disrespected creates a real anger. Um, and this has been found in research on gender and race. For example, um, when whites have, uh, are exposed to information about the changing racial dynamics um, that will make uh, whites a minority in the United States, they've been found to actually oppose welfare programs more strongly. Um, backlash against women increases when um, women violate expectations of the gendered order by being too dominant. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Arlie Hochschild's uh, 2016 book, uh, Strangers in Their Own Land, but she outlines how white rural working class voters feel their hard work is being ignored as outsider groups get special privileges. And they feel disrespected and treated by contempt by the urban elite who look down at them as racist and ignorant deplorables, which push them into more kind of reactive exclusionist policies. Now we're on the other side, right? Those who have long experienced discrimination fight as much for respect, acknowledgement, recognition that they too have enduring hardships and that they too have uncredited value to society. Much of what has been dismissed as identity politics in modern life is also truly deeply motivated by people asking to be seen and heard and valued um, as contributing members of our society. So in this regard, I think of the Lord of the Flies as kind of a warning to us as the power of status, or rather the power of what occurs when we deny people esteem and value. The lack of mutual respect for feeling valued in society can cause anybody to kind of push back against perceived slights, especially when the external context gives them the opportunity to, to justify any type of pushback. And everyone just wants to be acknowledged for their contributions. We all want to be seen for the sacrifices uh, that we make for the collective good. And when we don't do that, we get a surefire way to kill people's affinity and attachment to society as we know it. It's not that change or upheaval is negative. Like, it, it can be a great thing. It's just that the transition itself can fall into violence if people's reactions to status threats or having a continual denial of respect have angered them so much that they choose to leave or rebel like Jack did. And unlike the boys, like, you know, we are, we're grown-ups, we're adults, we're the only ones who can save ourselves. Don't point to me when you say it. We can save ourselves. <laughs> um, so. yeah, we're in trouble. <laughs> That's right. Tough, tough way. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes. And if I go, uh, I have some PowerPoint slides here. If I start going through them really quick, I'm only doing it out of respect for your time, I promise. Uh, so um, anyway, um, so I, I read this novel. I read this novel for the first time when... I, I got didn't get it till high school, so when I was when I was young, it took longer, I guess, to get to Lord of the Flies. It must have been like forty some years ago, uh, and I was amazed how much I remembered of this book. Uh, and, uh, and and as I went through, I, I saw oh, there's so many metaphors and allegories and symbols in the book, and I just jotted down some of them uh, on this slide. I'm not going to go through them all. I'm going to talk mainly about. The conch. Okay, so uh, I'm going to limit myself largely to the conch. Although I was, I remembered most of them, but this idea, I, I didn't remember this at all. Like 30 times in that book, they're talking about how the kids have hair in their eyes. I'm wondering, what on earth is that all about? Like in, in the button down world of 1954, the worst thing in the world would be a boy with long <laughs> hair or something. Uh, but but it was interesting uh, to, to look at uh, how, how he used that as a symbol. For, but I, I won't go into the symbolism of that. Instead, uh, let's talk about the conch. Uh, and uh, this is a picture I got. So on one side you have uh, Jack with the spear. On the other you have uh, Ralph uh, with the conch. I actually found a conch that we had in the house. I was trying to practice blowing it. Uh, I got, finally, I got a mouse squeak. I said, I'm not going to do it. Uh, so I didn't bring the conch. I wanted to blow it. But instead, I brought this. OK, this is like the conch, OK? For law students, this is the conch. Okay. So, um, and so I thought, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about the conch and what the conch represents? 
And it seemed fairly clear to me, I mean, other people might have a different take, that what the conch means, it means something kind of like the rule of law or civilization or, or rules or fairness or that sort of thing. So that's what the conch is meant to symbolize uh, in the book. And, and so the question becomes, why do we pay attention to the conch or where does the conch come from? So where did the conch come from? Ralph found, it was just a shell. Ralph found it in the water. It was nothing. It, it didn't mean anything. All of the meaning of the conch was created by what the boys invested into it. They, they poured into it a meaning uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and, and Piggy knows how to make a sound out of the conch. He teaches Ralph. Ralph uses the conch to call the boys from all over the island. They come and soon enough they make Ralph the leader largely because he's the one with the conch. He's the one with the trumpet thing. Uh, and so they make him the leader, and then they have this rule. Whenever they're in assembly, whoever holds the conch holds the floor, right? So uh, if someone's speaking, they're being interrupted. You know, Piggy points to the conch, and they all shut up, and they listen to this person. What is the power, the mystical power of this shell uh, over these uh, people? And as we say that, just think about this. What is the mystical power? Of this, what what significance does this have? Or if I had a robe up here, why does it uh, why does it actually uh, mean anything? Finally, by page seventy eight in the book, Ralph is quote feeling an affectionate reverence for the conch, even though he had fished the thing out of the lagoon, says, <laughs> says the author. Uh, and then and then ultimately, we have this uh, this on page ninety two. Piggy says. This is after uh, Piggy and Ralph are now all alone. All the other boys have gone over with Jack to the other side of the island. Piggy says, blow the conch, Ralph. You've got to be tough now. Make them do what you want. And then Ralph is answered in the cautious voice of one who rehearses a theorem. If I blow the conch and then they don't come back, we've had it. We shan't keep the fire going. We'd be like animals. We'll never be rescued. In other words, I don't know if the conch is going to work its magic anymore. Uh, with these folks. And Piggy then says, if you don't blow it, we'll be like animals anyway. So in other words, you got to blow the conch. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, then uh, what happened is that, uh, you know, what, they come and they steal Piggy's glasses out of the tent. Piggy's all defiant. He wants to go back and get his glasses. Uh, he actually, there's this passage on page 171 where he says, I'm going to go to, ta to Jack with this conch in my hand, this magic conch. Uh, and I'm going to tell him, give me back my glasses. Not because you're strong, not because I'm asking, because you've got to, because it's right. Give me my glasses, I'm going to say, you've got to. Uh, and so Piggy does pretty much that, right? And what happens to Piggy? Here I, I read from page 181. The rock struck Piggy a glancing blow from chin to knee, this rock that they rolled down from the hill on top of him. The conch, which he was holding, exploded into a thousand white fragments and ceased to exist. Piggy, saying nothing, with no time for even a grunt, traveled through the air sideways from the rock, turning over as he went. Piggy fell 40 feet, landed on his back across the square red rock in the sea. Kerplunk. His head opened, stuff came out and turned red. His arms and legs twitched a bit like a pig's after it's been killed. No coincidence that we had pigs and piggy on the island, right? And then the sea breathed again in a long, slow sigh. The water boiled white and pink over the rock. And when it went, sucking back again, the body of piggy was gone, just like the body of Simon had been washed out again uh, to the sea uh, and, and was gone. Uh, and so... Um, Wow, I guess the conch didn't work. We had this sudden demise of the conch. And I think that there's a, a parable here to kind of know what are the limits uh, of the conch. I was reminded of Shakespeare, of course, being a literate lawyer. And there's this one passage that says, I can call spirits from the vasty deep. And what was the response? Why, so can I, or so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? Will anybody come when you blow the conch or when you pound the gavel? Will they listen to you? And what's really the source of the authority of the law in that respect? So I thought further about it. And I thought, who, 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 who is this? Everybody knows, of course. Ah, Chief Justice John Marshall. Okay, so this is John Marshall. 
when he inherited the Supreme Court uh, in like the early 1800s, it was a weak and feeble institution. In fact, there had been four chief justices already because no one really even wanted the job because it wasn't worth anything. Uh, Marshall took the job and somehow over the course of decades, he made the Supreme Court a powerful institution, a respected institution, one that when it spoke and said what the law was, people listened. Um, how did he do it? How did he blow the conch, basically? How did he build up what I call conch power? He slowly accreted the power of the court in small ways, but not by overreaching beyond what he could do. The famous case of Marbury v. Madison, where he established the power of the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution, to say what the law is, to rule the actions of other branches unconstitutional. He did all that, but he did it in a sly way that didn't require the president to do anything. He basically said, I don't have any jurisdiction to require the president to do anything, but here's what the law is. And he was like an oracle and a prophet who did that slowly and accreted the power that he could have. Uh, other cases here, they're all starting with M, just like Marshall. I don't know why that is. Uh, I'm not going to go through them because I don't have time. Ultimately, uh, in 1830-something, uh, towards the end of his career, he decided the case of Worcester v. Massachusetts, a case involving the right of Native Americans to have sovereignty on their own lands. The state of Georgia had prosecuted a missionary who had had the temerity to go on to the Cherokee lands and to evangelize them and try to teach them how to read. So they were prosecuting him, and the notion was, does Georgia have the authority uh, with respect to what happens on Native American lands? And Marshall ruled in favor of the Native Americans, saying that their land rights had been recognized by federal treaty and would supersede the rights of Georgia. And Andrew Jackson, who was then president, big states' rights guy, uh, he said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Okay? So the notion is, okay, yeah, you blow the conch, you did that, but, but who's going to make, interestingly enough, he wasn't asking Jackson to do anything. It had to do with the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia chose to commute the sentence of these individuals three months later. So it actually worked. What does that have to do for our present day? I thought of just some examples in the history of the court, in our case, when the court was blowing the conch. And I'll just kind of uh, lift these up here. And you can decide for yourself, are these situations where they blew the conch to do justice in situations where they could? Or were these cases where they were overreaching in some way, in a way that diminished the power of the court or the respect of the court? Different people might have different views about what they thought of these things. Brown v. Board of Education was issued as a decision in 1954, the same year as this book. Probably a pretty astounding success of a decision in terms of history, but maybe it wasn't entirely clear at the time whether it would be or not. What if it hadn't worked? What if the Supreme Court had spoken and nobody did anything? It did take a long time to get people to come along. Even this state, wow, what were people doing? Uh, we, we had cities closing the public school systems just to avoid having blacks and whites go to school uh, together, just miles uh, from here. That happened uh, for years. Uh, but ultimately, it prevailed. Uh, the Miranda case, the Roe case, and then in more modern times, Bush v. Gore, as the, as the court has moved right, Citizens United, uh, Shelby County. Uh, in all, people are trying to do what they think is justice, what they think is the right thing, but they're doing it in a way, is it? Is it legitimate? Or is the legitimacy of the court fading as one side or another tries to seize the reins of power, to seize the conch, and to try to force everybody else to do uh, what they want, just like Piggy was telling Ralph. So I had uh, a little picture that I imagined in my head. I apologize if anyone's offended. So here we have uh, the Chief Justice and Justice uh, Scalia, and I imagine Scalia rising from his grave and whispering into Robert's ears, come on, John, come on, blow the conch, blow the conch. You've got to be tough now. Make them do what you want, okay? Earl Warren, he says, would have blown the company. Uh, and, so, uh, and so is, but what kind of chief justice is Justice Roberts going to be, and what is he? Uh, and 
and he had, it's been interesting. He's had an interesting history in that regard. He is someone that has a lot of respect for the institution of the court. Uh, and so if you look at the various cases he's decided, there have been times where he said, no, we're not going to blow the conch on this one. We're going to defer. We're going, other times, the conch has been blown. So it'll just be interesting to see what, what comes up uh, in the future uh, for all of this. So uh, ultimately, I think, uh, uh, you know, the conch does in fact need the support of the sword in order to prevail. Maybe that relates a little bit to what Professor Chin was saying. Well, you got to work together in some way uh, to make this thing uh, work. So I think I've used up enough time. I had another point, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, fantastic book, and uh, I'm glad we're able to read it again. Uh, so thanks very much. All right, so um, we are slated to go up to 6 o'clock. And um, if you can stay a little bit longer than that, I think we may uh, hopefully have a lot of questions. I did want a little bit more time, but, but I think we can, we can um, slide some in here. Um, anybody in the audience have a question, a comment, a memory, um, reactions to what you've heard any of the, uh, the panelists share this evening? Panelists, if you have anything for, uh, to pose to the other panelists, we'd love to hear that as well. Come on, someone has to have a response. I, mean, I think that the question that follows this book around is the lack of any women or, or female characters in the, in the book. And so is it easy to make these large societal proclamations about what this book means when half a society isn't even included in the book? Take for that. Well, it's a lot more than half a society. You have a bunch of white English boys, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, but to, but uh, to some level, I would say, I think you can make generalizations even from that because all people are people. And sure, this book is probably written from a pretty English-centric white. Se I mean, there's some offensive phrases in there. What Piggy is saying at some point, uh, yeah, well, you know, we're not savages. We're we're good English boys. Uh, you know, very ethnocentric uh, comment. But ultimately, I think that the truths about these boys could probably be said about almost any human beings. But maybe others would disagree. I saw that your hand go up. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering the exact same thing that Franklin did with that. Is it, but I'd love to see a book written that's sort of a follow up to this. And I, Professor Chen, I'm interested in maybe in your perspective on that in particular, from bringing a sociological perspective. I know, for example, that a percentage of child soldiers are female, right? And I don't know what what Mark might, what kind of insights Mark might have as to how if all, an all female island and schoolgirls. If they're middle school age, I was once a girl in middle school. It <laughs> might be as scary. So, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. We actually we, we just had that we had a talk conversation because like a, a couple yeah. of years ago we were talking about how there was a movie like a two uh, a male author and a director uh, decided to make an all female uh, Lord of the Flies and there was a pushback against it uh, and I thought it was really interesting because like I was just thinking about like I don't necessarily agree with the critique that like this couldn't possibly happen with women but I do think it's interesting if you think about how males and females are socialized differently would the way that the 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 dynamics the power dynamics um, play out look differently. So, like I was imagining uh, that, like instead of actually outright killing Piggy and uh, outright uh, uh, killing uh, uh, Simon, that they might actually be pushed to suicide instead. Mm -hmm. Kind of like convinced that, like you know, like oh, you're just like not doing stuff for the group. Like, uh, like uh, just the, the kind of a, uh, the potential for the same processes to happen exactly, but maybe look differently in the process by which it happened um, because of the way that men and women are socialized differently to take out their aggressions on. Uh, 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 like uh, to interact differently could potentially look really different. Yeah, no, I mean, it's inevitable in considering this book that it's written in a, in a particularly, particular historical space. I would argue that Golding expressly featured the cast of characters that he did because that's the cast of characters with which he was the most familiar, I think. And, and I think this is one thing that one maybe loses sight of a bit when it comes to historical reflection on literary genres that are not fully inclusive. I, I, 
I think so much of this work is in part autobiographical to some extent. And it's him talking about that with which he is the most familiar, and that is a set of English schoolboys between the ages of six and 12 that sort of m mimic, in a sense, his, his own comfort zone. Um, I also think the book is written off if we simply assume it to be a bunch of testosterone emerging masculinities. Yeah, child soldiers, roughly 40% of child soldiers worldwide are girls, and one can hypothesize about toxic femininities as well as toxic masculinities, but certainly in the world of child soldiers, um, girl soldiers are not only the victims of acts of violence, but are, are, are often, when in positions of power, extremely violent perpetrators. Um, in some ways, without difference uh, than their, their, their male co-soldiers or soldiers on the other side. So I, I, I do think, I, I'm with Dave, like I, I, I do think one can postulate forward from the experience of a subset. But after all, isn't that what we always do in all kinds of literature? It's the universalization of our own experience or the experiences of that which, with which we are the most familiar. And, and to chide this book for its non-inclusive nature and to suggest that leads to an impossibility of extrapolation on a broader level suggests that no human experience can serve as a basis for any universal extrapolation. And I, 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 I don't buy that. Wow. <laughs> yes. Uh, Professor Drumble, um, I was wondering um, when you were talking about the victimization of child soldiers, um, I was wondering if you see this book as maybe different from um, what we see in child soldiers around the world, because instead of some adult leader or adult tribe, they were all kind of given the same uh, kind of level, like they, they were all alone, they were all at that same place and just someone stepped up as opposed to um, like an adult or power figure coming in and corrupting, I don't know if that's the right word, mm -hmm. but um, I, I guess how, how do you think that might affect the day after when they all get back on the transport back to England? Yeah, so that's a great question, Austin. You know, so in, there's one scene at the beginning of the book where uh, Roger, a, a boy who does not get a lot of airtime in the book, is walking around as a little one. That's a little kid, you know, and, and Roger's got like, he wants to throw a rock to knock a, a coconut or some fruit down on the little kid, and, and he refrains to do, do, from doing so because, as Golding writes, he, he still has the imprint of parental authority and rules and the schoolmaster and the headmaster in the back of his mind, so refrains from it. Um, I think the modern child rights movement and the international human rights of the child constituency um, would not fancy this book because it does not map on the vision that circulates with regards to both child soldiers but also war affected, crime affected youth more generally. Certainly with child soldiers, the narrative is that the children are innocent and are corrupted by malevolent adults. Um, and I think a strong point of the book is that, that children can be extremely cruel to each other and children have capacities for great levels of violence. And I also think that it's important not to over-determine the difference between children and adults. That's why my remarks are trying to you know, slide to the, the collective cataclysm that involve adults as well. Because I actually think if you speak to a lot of adults, as in my experience, who are involved in situations of collective criminality, and, and I think a lot of adults in that context would also think it's a bit of a game. 
would also think it's a bit of a fantasia, would also think that it's planet Auschwitz, right? It's something so removed and remote from normal life. And on the perpetrator side, people may be high on all kinds of notions of ethnic, religious, racial, national infallibility or, 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 or the desperation of self-defense. But I think also for adults, as is for children, the beast lurks in each of us. And I think in many cases, the metastasis of persecution into the final solution is a move from a game that then suddenly only after it's all over does one realize that it's not a game anymore. Yeah, it's, it's very serious. And actually, it's, uh, in, in response to a few of these points, they point out what happens in the next chapter or what's happening in the yeah. outside world. If, if you recall, this is, there's actually a war going on raging outside yes. in the real world. There's a question of whether the plane was actually shot down, right? And there's a comment about the atom bomb, I think, at some point, and whether England even exists. Why are, why are English schoolboys in the South Pacific somewhere, right? Maybe they had to go down to the, south, the, um, the Southern Hemisphere because the... Northern Hemisphere, you know, Europe's been, you know, decimated by a nuclear attack of some type. And that, I think that's a very real thing that in 1954, of course, the, right at the kind of beginning stages, but the very scary stages of the Cold War, that was a big question about what was going on. And so I think that's a, a definitely a parallel to, to understand and, and that, that really in, the big, in this adult world that, that they kind of, um, you know, vaunt or they understand that these adults have it all figured out and that's who we look to for authority, that they're really carrying on in, in a, on a much grander scale in a very similar way to the, uh, as the children in tribalistic fashion. And of course, it's a, it's a Navy destroyer that comes to actually um, rescue the children in the end, too. So that was just my two cents. Yeah. But I, I definitely, it's, it's already 6.03. If anyone has to sneak out, that's fine. But I do maybe want to ha have time for one or two more questions. So, yes. In the, in the um, I think a lot of these comments are really, really interesting. One thing to think of about the uh, hospital insertion, if there had been an insertion of women into, or girls into this, is prior to the violence and everything, the decision making process. And I say this because I've done it in a class once. Uh, they were doing, um, they were doing a presentation on jury decision making. And uh, they took some of the books that talk about the differences in the way that women and men will process uh, decision making. And we divided the class into three groups. One was all male, one was all female, and one was combined. And it was, I mean, here are all these law students, and they're sort of like, oh, we're egalitarian, you know, we're not going to follow you, or whatever. And it was as though it had been scripted. I wish so much I had taped it at the time. You know, because it was, it was um, the men all sat around, and they literally, it, there was a, a fact pattern. And, and you were supposed to come to a consensus as to who in the fact pattern um, was guilty, right? And, you know, and there were all these different things to consider. And, and, and a lot of the things, rightly so, you know, could kind of go either way. And the, the, men, the men's group, sat there and they kind of faced each other and they literally came to like blows and they would say, I think A, B, and C. And the other one would go, no, C and D. And then go, well, okay, I'll give you A if you give me D. You know, and it was like this sort of power struggle kind of thing, but you know, a negotiation within that. The women took the chairs and moved them into a circle and sat there and literally <laughs> said things like, Oh, and what would you say? Okay, well, so and so, this one says, you know, A and B. What do you think about that? Oh, okay, well, C and D. Well, why do you think that you would And it was this whole kind of process of really discussing it, but being very, um, very uh, conscious of what other people said and thought and not wanting to sort of um, assert power over the other one. And then the men and women's group literally just like couldn't even talk. I mean, they would they they got up and they they like, walked off because it just was impossible for them to come to any kind of um, consensus, even in how to make a decision. It was really really interesting. And so in 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 the book, had it been you know with girls also. Maybe there's a possibility that, that even before there were some of these power struggles, there'd be real differences in, in how they would come to making decisions on language. Could you 
All right, so, uh, so Mark, if you have a response, and then we'll take one more question. Yeah, you know, I, I, so I've thought and written and, and I've thought a lot about, not in terms of decision making, but women perpetrators of atrocity is quite an interest of mine. And um, my sense is that uh, the only difference between the numbers of women perpetrators of atrocity versus male perpetrators of atrocity, male perpetrators being much larger in number, are sexist societies in which women just don't wield as much power as men do in context where there's co-equal um, opportunities to metastasize into this. I, I don't see women sitting around holding hands, arranging chairs, right? I, I just don't see that I, in my experiences in conflict spaces. It's the same thing. So I, that's, but, but, but I don't know, yeah, right? Yeah, I, mean, I wonder about the context a little bit, because clearly that, that's true. There are women who do all kinds of horrible things, and little girls can be awful as the parent of some of these ones on the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, I know exactly what your point, you know, where to push that button, and I'll do it and see if I can make you cry. So, um, yeah, girls can be terrible, but, but maybe, I mean, it, it's hard to say what happens without context, you know, and without, well, were they really in a place where they were sort of starting at zero, or does all the the you know stuff that they come with from some you know uh, the where they were in England and, and how they've been brought up and, and all that already preform how they might do things? All right. Well, looking at the time, um, I think I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I see some people already creeping out of here. I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if we do, if, if people yeah, have, okay. maybe, yeah, no, actually, and I actually didn't mean to pun you, Carrie answered, but I was actually pointing to you, so actually that would be good. Thank you, Mark. No, 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 I, that's, it's not a problem, but yes, please, go ahead. I just saw you already creeping, so I was like, oh. so, yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that one of the things this book teaches us is uh, what happens when we put context into things and then you said that one of, like, one of the things that status is is acknowledging that someone has been seen. And so that kind of makes Jack, Jack a little bit of a sympathetic character. And really my question to you then is, is everyone deserving of status? So should they have given Jack status? And what are we to make of the Jacks? Of right. Them? Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great question because I think I also when I was uh, uh, thinking about this because it's like oh I've got to wrap it up somehow and I, there's a distinction between mattering and status unfortunately status as we know it it's a collective order that we all agree upon that's rank ordered so no one you know you there has to be an inequality in there but I think that mattering being valued feeling that you're valued that your contributions are protected that everybody deserves that I mean, like, like there's got to be some sort of redemption, even in what we think of as the worst case kind of scenario. And when you give people value, and so there's actually this really interesting um, study about kind of like um, uh, how much uh, how much money or like how much money or how much power does someone have versus kind of like in your local community, are you respected versus kind of like the the grander scheme, um, and that it, when your local community being respected mattered so much more than whether or not I was like high here, you know, like like. A, in, or if I was low, I could be low, but if I felt respected by my community, my quality of life and happiness was so much better. And I think to me, I guess then the answer is yes. You know, like, like a, um, I, I don't know at what point, uh, you guys have probably better, like at what point there is no redemptive feature, but if there is value in something, I feel like the power of the book is saying like, everybody deserves at least being seen. Like if, if you can be seen, then that there's something in that that qualitatively makes, you know, like. <laughs> well, I, I I really like your putting Jack in, in a, a more of an empathetic space because we could also engage in a path of putting Ralph in a more critical space. You know, at the beginning, he's actually not all that nice. He's actually Piggy becomes his friend at the end, and in that last par passage, he. He regrets the loss of his wise and good friend. But he was kind of an ass to Piggy at the beginning, right? You know, he tells the Piggy implores him not to tell everyone his nickname. And then he, Ralph tells it to everyone. And then Piggy goes, you betrayed me. And Ralph goes, 
well, fine, but I could have told him you were called fatty. Piggy's not as bad, right? <laughs> like, Ralph is kind of mean, right? So I, I think this is also an interesting dynamic. And you can also construct Ralph as is also very, very selfish, right? But we don't because, as David, you point out beautifully, you know, like, he's the man with the conch as opposed <laughs> to the dude with the sphere, with spear, right? So... So I think there's also, you could do a reading of, um, of, of uh, Ralph in a way that could be quite critical as well. And Piggy, I just find Piggy exhaust. I find Piggy really irritating, actually. Plus he also justified kind of like killing of Simon. He's like, ah, oh, but like we were all, right? Yeah, like, like he's, right. he's not completely sympathetic, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. Piggy's also a bit of a gaslighter. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this, this conversation really could continue, I think, uh, uh, a lot longer, and maybe, maybe we'll do a part two at some point next year. We'll definitely have the same event next year, but it'll be a different book to be determined. Um, a few thanks, though. First, I wanted to thank my colleagues in the WNL Law Library, especially Allegra Steck, who helped with a lot of the logistics for this evening. Uh, thanks to Keith Vuitton for uh, video recording, and of course, thanks again to our panelists, Mark Drumble, uh, Lynn Chin, and David Eggert. So thank you. And thanks to you all for coming.